Hey guys, and welcome to BioWare Follower. Well, it looks like it's that time again. Time to see where all the companions rank in terms of how much they aggravated and annoy the player. Some of them will be very subjective, and others... <laughs> Not so much. So, let's kick off our democratically voted 10 most hated companions from Dragon Age. <laughs> Number 10. Fenris. <sighs> well, it looks like my bay made it onto the most hated list again. Although I can't say I don't understand the reasons why. Of all the companions in DA2, Fenris is the party member that benefits the most from spending the most amount of time in party banter. Whilst Isabella's hidden heart of gold, Meryl's grit and determination, and Anders' declining mental health are all things that are apparent in their actions throughout the plot, if you accidentally miss his personal quest in Act 2, it's really easy to bug yourself out of his remaining character development, without even realising you've done it. So instead of this incredibly nuanced character, he just becomes that grumpy guy whose questline never went anywhere. But if you do follow through on his questline and you get to know him, you discover... The guy is actually hilarious! Well, good. I always knew she had some sense. Do not make light of this. Leaving was the hardest thing I've ever done. Oh, will you two get over yourselves? You're like two dogs around a bitch in heat. We were talking about Hawk, not you. His whole gentle and awkward coming out of his shell is really compelling. Especially when contrasted with his rage at the whole slavery mages thing. I am not your slave! Well, yes, quite. You might be thinking, wow, this seems like an awfully biased defense of Fenris, and you would be absolutely right. What? Sure, I have to write this democratically elected list, but no one said I had to be impartial. No, I don't care about artistic or journalistic integrity on this one. Fenris. The broody elf who failed to steal your heart. Number 9. Velana. Now here's a character is a struggle to find people who actually like her. For those who didn't play Dragon Age Awakening, here's your introduction to this Dalish lady. She's been tricked into attacking innocent traders for months because a bunch of darkspawn dumped a load of human weapons by her camp after her sister was taken. She then proceeds to bitch and moan about how the Dalish are victims of humans, which can be a bit rich if she's addressing a Maharial warden, and then you find out that her clan kicked her out for being too much of a hothead, and nobody likes her. Well, it's not true that nobody likes her, in the party at least. Nathaniel Howell seems to have something of a teasing, flirty relationship with her, but it doesn't go anywhere. And don't we just know there's nothing fangirls love more than a female character flirting with a male character they like. Yes, she does have a few sympathetic moments involving her sister, but it's not explored enough to justify her previous actions. She just comes across as a stupid, petulant child. Valana, your plan to save your sister was clownish, and so are your ears. What? Who's juvenile now? Number 8. Logan McTeer. So here we have our first, depending on your origin, traitor. He certainly won't be the last in this series, or on this list. So let's see how our first major antagonist for the Dragon Age franchise managed to make us hate him so much. Well, you can't help but be suspicious of the guy the first time you see him. Compared to King Kaelin, who acts like he walked straight out of a King Arthur legend, Duncan, your kind and mentally grey warden, Alistair the cutie pie, and Loghain. Looking for all the world like Alan Rickman, if he hadn't slept for a week, with the voice of legendary gaming badass Kane from the Legacy of Kane series, everything about him seems to be set up to contrast him with the squeaky clean Kalen. No, not, not that one. Ah, there he is. So when he turns around and throws his son-in-law to hordes of rampaging darkspawn, no one was really surprised. However, I don't think this is where the hatred of Loghain comes from because he is genuinely a deeply complex and compelling character, especially if you've read A Stolen Throne. Something Bioware fans usually lap up. No, I'm fairly sure it boils down to the land's meat choice, where unless you've made very particular choices, you have to choose between Alistair's friendship or Loghain's recruitment. And if you choose Loghain, it's quite possible that Alistair will end up as a miserable drunk. In the heat of the moment, especially on your first playthrough, it's really hard not to feel like you're betraying Alistair. 
especially if you're romancing him. And by this point, the game is nearly at its climax. You don't have the story content to spend getting to know Logan's opinions on anything, so unless you're prepared to bribe him into liking you, a lot of the reasons for his fanatical hatred of Orlais can seem overzealous. I mentioned she was taken from us, did I not? This was when Orlais still ruled, and it was an Orlesian lordling who took her. He wanted to mix the blood of our noble Marbari with their frail, wasp-wasted game hounds, which were bred for looks, not intelligence. Tried to keep her, but there was little I could do to stop the Orlesian. <laughs> wasn't even a man. You can imagine what it was like for her, being torn away from the boy, the family she was bonded to. It was six months before we saw her again, and the Orlesians returned her. When I say returned, I mean pushed her out of his wagon. She was skin and bone, and still carried the scars from where their pronged collars bit into her neck. She never quite recovered. She passed away after a week. It was as though she held on long enough to come home to us. I held her head in my lap. I believe she died happy. Or not. Logain, incredibly tragic and complex character, as well as an unrepentant traitor, which earned him his spot at number 8. And speaking of traitors, number 7, Solus. Okay, by the time Inquisition rolled around, all of the fandom was looking at the announced apostate on the team to be the bearer of some dramatic twist. It's tradition by this point with Morrigan and Anders each having earth-shattering revelations at the end of their respective games. But over the course of the game, I guess most of us just sort of glossed over Solus with our suspicions of him. I mean, outside of the whole hobo-shaman thing he's got going on, as well as the distractingly sexy accent, and gorgeous grey eyes, he's just so... dreamy. Ha! That was too good to pass up. But yeah, so you spend the entire adventure with Solus, and he doesn't do anything particularly traitorous or act against you in any way. Until he just vanishes after the final battle with Karifishitz. No explanation, just says something cryptic and then up and leaves with all that high-end loot you gave him. It's only when you sit through the end credits that it's revealed that he's the Dalish trickster god Fenharel. The Dreadwolf. And by giving Karifishitz his orb, Solus caused everything the Elder One did. And after you're reeling from that particular bombshell, he seems to kill and steal the power of Flemethal. And if you romance him, he tells Lavellan that he loves her, tells her the Valisleen on her face, something that the Dalish wear as a badge of liberation from Devinter slavery, are actually slave markings. Something soul-crushing to anyone remotely familiar with the Dalish. So he offers to remove the Valisleen for you. Which you can refuse, but Lavellan is now burdened with the knowledge that the ancestors the Dalish so revere and seek to emulate were just as bad as the magisters that enslaved their people for generations. And if Lavellan does let him take the Valisleen off, she'll now be a pariah among the Dalish. She'll be seen as choosing a life among Shemlin rather than preserving the culture and traditions of her people. She'll be making herself a flat ear. And if she does this, Solus will tell her she's beautiful, kiss her, touch her ass then break up with her. With no explanation except for this. I can't. Wait. Why does this feel familiar? I can't. I can't. Oh my god, I have a type. I remember a while back there was a post floating around Tumblr that said if you stand in front of a mirror, spin around three times and say, I can't. You will summon a sad elf boyfriend. So us members of the wolf pack that were stuck in the solar Val and hell thought that when Trespasser came out, we'd finally get some answers. Because while we, the audience, knew Solus as Fenharel, the Inquisitor didn't. So two years after breaking up, we charged through hordes of rampaging Canari, stopped an invasion, and chased Solus through the Alluvian network to finally call him out on his shit. 
As it turns out, Silas could basically kill you with a thought if he wanted, and has chucked all the gear he stole, and has gotten himself some fancy new duds. He explains to the Inquisitor that, yes, he's Van Harel. The gods Lavellan believed in all her life are actually tyrannical but mortal mages that Solus locked behind the veil. Oh, and BT dubs he created the veil, and his long-term plan is to tear it down, causing more war and chaos to restore the world of the elves that have been dead for thousands of years. Well, I've had some awkward run-ins with an ex, but that takes a biscuit. And if you romanced him, you can even tell him. Solus. I wish it could for none. Loosely translated, the path of our love will endure. Then he kisses you, takes your hand, and walks off. Man, Lavellan must be a glutton for punishment because she might have the worst luck in the history of Thedas when it comes to love. You thought you met a kind and gentle Eggman, turns out he wants to kill the world. You think you know a guy? Solus. The egg, we hope, isn't rotten to the core. Number six. Carver Hawk. If you've played Dragon Age 2 and you played a mage, chances are high that you muttered, ugh, shut up, Carver, at least five times during Act 1. Especially if you played a warrior or rogue first. Because if you did, you ended up with Bethany Hawk as a companion instead. And where Bethany is brave, kind, sweet, and supportive of Hawk, her twin brother Carver is grumpy, petulant, surly, and constantly questioning Hawk's decisions. Where Carver suffers is that his character arc into becoming likeable is kind of dependent on a number of factors that aren't immediately obvious. If you decide not to take him into the deep roads like your mother begs you to, then he'll reward your protective instincts as his elder sibling to become a Templar. Deciding the only way to get out of his elder sibling's shadow is to join an order of people whose goal it is to control and imprison free mages. Mages like Carver's twin, his brother or sister, and his father. But if you did take him into the deep roads and you didn't bring Anders with you, then he gets the blight and he dies. It didn't help that before the Legacy DLC, it was literally impossible to max out Carver as a friend. Because he was so skewed into being a rival with Hawk that even if you got every single friendship point, you couldn't max him out, and he was the only companion in the game that had that problem. Because if you tried, you could get Bethany to rival. Why you would want to is another matter entirely. But if you manage to do everything right and make him a Grey Warden, he does turn up when the Aeroshock invades Kirkwall, and promptly leaves, saying, oh, he'd love to stay and help, but he's got some uber-important secret warden -y business going on. It's literally only at the final fight between the Mages and the Templars, where the best version of Carver... I know best is debatable in a Bioware game, but the version of Carla that has the healthiest sibling relationship with Hawk is a friended warden. And due to the limitations of him only being there for combat and to be able to have a last goodbye talk with Hawk, that was all the character development he got in the vanilla game. It wasn't until Mark of the Assassin and Legacy DLCs came out that he rejoined the party, and the party, and by extension the player, was able to see how much he'd grown as a character, leaving behind that bitter little brother persona and realising his calling by devoting himself to a cause is something genuinely sweet. It also helped that he developed a sense of humour about himself, about how much of an arse he used to be. So, we're lost. Just like old times. Maker, I hope not. I was an ass. <laughs> Fair comment, Junior. All right, let's get this done. Carver, for the annoying little brother you wish would just move out and get a job already. Number five, Ogren. Now this one surprised me. Usually when lists like this crop up, the same types of characters tend to crop up. The weaker written, the betrayers, the characters that commit atrocities without any kind of justification. It's honestly rare for the relatively inconsequential comic relief characters to make on this list, let alone this high. Just to put this in perspective, he beat out a character whose goal is literally to kill the world. Personally, I think that Ogren is friggin' hilarious, and Steve Bloom did a fantastic job voicing him. I mean, if you're a female warden and you invite Isabella for a three-way, you can short-circuit his brain. You're going with her? I... I thought you were joking. I can't let you do this. Not without me. Um, keeping an eye on the both of you. 
Who am I to deny such a pretty little thing as yourself, my dear? You are welcome to join us. <laughs> too, too, too much to handle. Stone. And oh my god, have you heard him and Zebrin going to rescue you at Fort Draken? And what are you supposed to be? We, sir, are performers from the Antiva City Circus. The famous Broma Brothers. Surely you have heard of us. You don't look like brothers. How can you say that? Are your eyes failing? Look at us, we are, we are twins. Not identical, of course, but twins nonetheless. I'm the pretty one. But for the purposes of this list, let's try and figure out why so many people seem to dislike him. For those not looking for any depth, he can certainly seem one note. You gotta hear this one. This human walks into a tavern, and there's an elf there, and she says... <laughs> and she says... <laughs> She says, I don't. <laughs> Especially if you're not paying attention to just how much Branca hurt him and how ashamed he is of himself. It can definitely seem a bit inconsistent when Bioware makes you laugh at him for being a drunken lurch, and then a minute later he's drinking himself into oblivion just so he doesn't feel guilty anymore. Ogwen's probably the straightest example of an alcoholic of all the characters Bioware has done, so it seems a little weird to try and play it for comedy and tragedy at the same time, sometimes within the same scene. And then there's his relationship with Felsi, especially by the time Awakening rolls around. So Ogwen decides, out of the blue, that family life isn't for him, so he abandons pregnant Felsi to go commit and become a Grey Warden. Unlike most of the other examples I can think of, this isn't portrayed as anything remotely noble, but entirely selfish and cowardly. But the Warden Commander can persuade him to take an active role in his child's life, and he'll even name them after the Warden Commander, which is pretty adorable, really. Ogryn, get over here, you wild dwarven stallion. No one touches Ogryn's junk and lives! Number four, Anders. Uh ho 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 ho. Oh, Andraste's flaming nickel weasels, where to start with Anders? <laughs> well, there is that, but honestly, even before that, I understand why people were beginning to lose their patience with Anders. For starters, I think the main fumble was, and I think this would easily have been remedied if they'd had more than a two year production cycle for Dragon Age 2, is that Anders' character arc never got to be about anything other than freedom for mages and being possessed. At least from a plot and quest perspective. Because Anders is in Kirkwall as a healer. He heals refugees for free, in a city where mages would be made tranquil for the slightest infraction. Especially apostates that nobody cared about. Personally, I was hoping his nature as a Grey Warden would have been explored a little bit more, considering that he would have been the first Grey Warden we would have been able to observe over a decade. It would have been interesting to see the effects the Blight would have on a person over that length of time. I also don't think Bioware made quite enough of a deal about just how much he was trying to force a peaceful or diplomatic solution to the Mage Templar crisis. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the Codex, but outside of his first scene, we never even see him healing. Unless you count Isabella using him as an STD clinic. Don't come running to me next time you pick up one of these diseases. Isn't that the point of magic? So instead of focusing on any of Anders' other qualities, the game just repeatedly beats you over the head with Mages should be free and Anders is losing his mind and is dangerously unstable. And then of course... He forces a war between the Mages and Templars, forcing the final fight of the game, just when it seemed that Grand Cleric Elthina might just be able to prevent conflict once again. Now the question, was Anders justified in blowing up the Chantry, is so divisive that people are still furiously debating it seven years later. So there is no way I'm dipping my toe in that pool of sulfuric acid. Well, not outside of its own very lengthy video on the subject. But let's tentatively back away from it and say that there are very strong opinions on both sides. In a way, 
and his betrayal was far worse than Loghain's, or even Solus. Even though both of them probably caused more innocent deaths in the long run, Solus has been alive for centuries beyond counting. He was never truly on the Inquisitor's side to begin with, and though Gain may as well have turned up with a sign that said, I am the villain! We met Anders in Awakening as the Warden Commander. We turned him into a Warden, watched him become friends with Justice. We grew to care about him. We became his friend as Hawk and watched him struggle and suffer. We may even have fallen in love with him. And in the end, it didn't make one bit of difference. What makes the Chantry incident so despicable, beyond the deaths and the chaos it caused, was that Anders lies to get Hawk to collect the materials for him and to help him sneak the bomb into the Chantry, all under the guise of a potion that will depossess and save him. Anders twisted Hawk's concern and love for him and made Hawk an accomplice in his crime. And the bastard has the balls to make a pun about it? Is it just a potion? Is there anything more to this ritual? No, no ritual. Just mix the ingredients up and boom. Why isn't there an option to do this with Anders? Thank you to Biofan for the punching Solus footage. But if you really hate Anders, you should have a go at sleeping with him and then rejecting him. The results are pretty hilarious, really. I'm not ready for that kind of commitment. What? I'm sorry. You just weren't that good. Anders, the backstabbing traitor that you can stab in the back. Number three, Sarah. Don't worry, I'm not going to start singing... yet. Sorry Sarah fans, but I do really get why she's on this list. When Sarah was announced as a Red Jenny in interviews, I think most fans got excited. Ooh, the mysterious Red Jennies! Are we going to finally find out how they operate? Will we finally find out what the hell was in that box in First Enchanter Irving's study that we gave them way back in Origins? And then Sarah shows up, and she's... Well, she's flippant, patronising, juvenile, and literally the first time we see her in the game is when she kills an unarmed man, and we just have to take her word that it was justified. She then starts, well explaining might be a bit too strong a word, but telling us that she's a worthwhile recruit for the Inquisition because she plays pranks on people for her own amusement. So let me get this straight. Sarah is trying to save the world from the breach, not because of some moral obligation or sense of duty, but because she wants to continue pulling pranks on people. And not just pranks, really unfunny pranks. So not the best impression to start off with, but for those who like Sarah, you know, all five of you, let me ask, what did she actually contribute to the plot in a tangible way? Cassandra helps start the Inquisition, Bull has a potential alliance with the Canari, Vivienne is basically the leader of all the circle mages outside Tevinta, Dorian brings time magic into the mix as well as valuable information on the Venatori, Varric brings his contacts and connection to Hawk, Solus and Cole are the only loners of the group but both have excellent justifications for being there. Solus is an expert on spirits in the Fade, and Cole, being a spirit living outside of the Fade, has a unique perspective on the Breach, spirits and demons. All of these things are incredibly valuable to the Inquisition. Sarah shoots things and gives you the recipe for a jar of bees. Sarah was never quite the quietest girl, but maybe she should give it a try. Ask Biscuit. Number 2. Sebastian Vale. A DLC character with virtually no impact on the plot made it onto a most hated list? What a shock. I remember hearing rumours in the lead up to Dragon Age 2 that Bioware was planning to have another DLC character. I got so excited because I love the hell out of Shale. Everyone does. My mind immediately started thinking of all the possibilities that Bioware could do. What fresh new perspective could this character have to enlighten the world of Thedas? Maybe a Magister from Tevinta, a Cerebas, a city elf that was tempted by the Kuhn, a Ravani seer to contrast with Isabella, a castless dwarf to contrast with Varric. But what fresh new perspective did we get? 
the Chantries, basically. The only reason we have Sebastian is because someone at Bioware thought the Chantry, easily the most explained and represented religion in the franchise, needed an extra character to make sure we'd heard their side of the story. Even more disappointingly, the original concept for this DLC was to revolve around Sebastian and Nathaniel Howe of all people. Imagine finding him in Act 3 must be all that remains of that content. What's particularly hilarious though is because of his nature as a DLC companion, the other characters for the most part just seem to pretend like he's not there, which becomes unintentionally hysterical when the Chantry blows up. I mean, he starts off with... Elfina, no! Maker, no! And all the other characters that he's been friends with for at least three or four years just ignore him like he's a needy child having a tantrum. Why are we debating the right of annulment when the monster who did this is right here? I swear to you, I will kill him. It can't be stopped now. Was that why you needed me to distract the Grand Cleric? You were part of this? If you knew what I was doing, you would have felt honor bound to stop me. Elfina is not the Circle. She was a good woman, and you murdered her! You fool! You've doomed us all! I might have understood if you'd only told me. You condone this. The brutal death of an innocent woman of faith, someone you knew, who trusted you. I wanted to tell you. But honestly, this wouldn't have sunk him for the fanbase as a whole if it wasn't for two things. Number one, he really doesn't have much in the way of a personality, especially in comparison to the other characters in the game. Stoic and nice aren't really qualities that are going to make you sparkle among this bunch. Wait, you've gone four years without. You must creak like a rusty hinge. You're splitting hairs, but wishing someone would split yours. I've had enough of your loose lips. Like many, I'm sure. Oh, touche. Prig. Slattern! If I might put this back on track. And number two, he's an incredibly indecisive character who doesn't learn anything and that will always be aggravating. So when we first meet Sebastian in Act 1, when he breaks his vow to become a brother in order to hire mercenaries to kill the mercenaries who killed his family, much to the horror of Grand Cleric Elthina, the next time we see him, he's trying to become a brother again, swearing this time he won't break his vow. Strangely enough, she has difficulty believing this, and Hawk has to spend the next two acts that span four years convincing him to make one decision, either commit to being a brother or forget the Chantry and reclaim Starkhaven from the people who murdered his family. What's particularly frustrating is that he's the only companion whose moral dilemma is entirely internal, whereas everyone else in the party has a mix of internal and external conflicts and each affect the other. You know, the way people in real life work. But the only thing holding Sebastian back from a resolution to this is just sitting down and thinking about it for 10 minutes. But we have to indulge Sebastian's navel gazing until he finally gets his shit together and decides on the Chantry if you're friends with him, and a prince if you rival him. Then Anders blows up the Chantry. But if Hawk spares him, Sebastian's will just blow up in their face, demanding that Anders dies or he'll go back to Starkhaven and return to Kirkwall with an army. So Sebastian plans to answer the slaughter of innocent people with the slaughter of more innocent people. Real charmer, this one. Sebastian, if you're looking for your Prince Charming in status, maybe try Alistair next time. Number one, Vivienne. Considering how diverse and widespread the Dragon Age fandom is, it is amazing how many different factions can come together in unity over their hatred for this character. Okay, for starters, the franchise as a whole is very much skewed in favor of mage liberation as the morally correct view for the series. I mean, think about it. Insane mages are portrayed as outliers, even in a game like Dragon Age 2, where blood mages were everywhere. Whereas Templars are generally seen as tyrannical and abusive dictators with the exception being people like Alistair or Cullen. So there's a special flavour of burning hatred most fans have for pro-Templar mages. So Vivienne ticks that box. Whilst her belief in the Templars seems sincere, 
is all tempered by her naked ambition. She wants to reclaim her position as the arcane advisor to the Empress after she was usurped by Morrigan, which immediately pits her against Morrigan and fans will choose Morrigan every time. She wants to be feared and envied by the court of Orlais, which she does by using magic on unarmed noblemen. She wants to lead the circles of Thedas, but only if she gets to be mistress to a duke and spends her life in complete freedom and luxury, whilst her fellow mages suffer the harrowing the right of tranquility and imprisonment. But I always seem to realise how much of an entirely unsympathetic hypocrite she was by making her beloved Bastien die halfway through Inquisition but I'm kind of baffled why this was executed in the way it was, because Vivienne will ask the Inquisitor to bring her the heart of a snowy wyvern. If you poke around, the game seems to be trying to make you believe it's either a frivolous waste of time, or she's trying to make a potion to make someone younger. So in a vacuum, you decide to give her the heart, or give her the heart of a regular wyvern. Vivienne then takes you to Bastian's deathbed, and the game seems to be delighted with itself. Ooh, look, she's sympathetic, really. You thought she wanted it for selfish reasons. Well, no, because neither the game nor Vivienne gave me enough information to make an informed decision on this one. And the way that her being emotionally vulnerable is played as a twist just seems kind of gross. I assume every Bioware character has a well-written reasons for doing what they do. I'm just waiting for Bioware to reveal what it is. But, oh, she tried to save the life of the man she loved and it didn't work could have been compelling if we knew about it. Maybe we could have met Bastien before this scene and actually had some investment in if he lived or died. The only instance approaching any real regret or deep-seated desire outside of ambition seems to be in this banter with a romanced black wall. I was just wondering how you imagined your future. The Inquisitor and the... Well, whatever you are now. Ah, uh, I see. You think we're a poor match. Lady Vivienne, that woman there will stand with Thedas's mightiest because of who she is. She may choose whomever she pleases, even an undeserving nobody. Envy her for her ability to love freely, but recognize that envy is what it is. It seems the one thing she wanted in the world was to be able to love Bastien openly, but she didn't because she wanted to keep her status more than she cared about being happy. In my playthroughs, I take great pride in making sure she will never, ever have a drop of meaningful power. She will never become divine, she will never leave the circles after the Inquisition saves the world. And judging by this list, it seems like the rest of the fandom does as well. Madame de Fer? More like Madame de Fuck Off. Fereth Chiral Felon, Mithala Nast.